so it's it's really weird to me the way uh, after the fact I feel like the Lord works. Would you turn the piano down just a little bit, Preston? Just for the prayer. Just for the prayer. Okay, and use that song. So I, I didn't realize until late in the week, last week. That Brother Mike was going to talk about worshiping faith. I just felt in the time that I spend with the Lord during the week, I'm always asking, what am I gonna do that will bring us to worship? We are in this 21st century, even though we're in the midst of the Bible Belt, and in one of the best places. I can't think of another place I'd rather be. We're in one of the best places God ever puts people, but we're very busy, amen? And 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 and, and we just we, we, we just get used to doing the same things and we just get we just get apathetic and we just go through motions and, and it, it's not really anybody's fault it's just it's just seven days a week 24 hours in a day and this is what we do and was just saying, just, just do this. Just maybe begin, instead of singing a song and stopping for prayer and then singing another song, just before the service ever starts, welcome the guests and just pray as a family over everything that's going to be done.
back to us today in our service.
honestly thought he'd have a mustache or be running into my mouth right now. I'm drowning up here, all right? But the grace of God is wonderful, amen? Oh, keep playing an intro, man. I've been watching this a little bit more.
we were agreeing today, I think it was April of 2021, the last time we did this as a congregational song, our family has decided this is one of our most favorite. Sing it with me. We have a little bit longer in the
God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And then verse 10, and there's uh, verses in between. And verse 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. It reminds me of Exodus 14, 14. And you know what's happening in that, that chapter of Exodus there in the Red Sea? And, and verse, uh, Exodus 14, 14 says, The Lord will fight for you. And sometimes you just have to be still. If you just, I just encourage you this week and every week just to find somewhere to be still in your heart and in your body and just begin to think about our precious God is. And just be still and be, be alone if you can in your heart.
beautiful song. As always. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me, if you will, to the New Testament to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11. We'll begin reading with verse 1. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 1. And I want to begin a new series of messages this morning from one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible. Hebrews 11 has been called God's roll call of faith. And the reason is because in these verses, the writer not only gives us the definition of faith, but he also gives us demonstrations of faith. He first of all defines what faith is, and then he goes all the way back to the beginning of time and gives us example after example after example of great men and women who lived lives of faith. And so, for the next few months, we're going to go through this particular chapter and just see what kind of faith these people had. And this morning, I want to share a message with you that's all entitled, A Worshiping Faith. Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 1, you stand with me. The writer says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. You may be seated. And I pray that the Lord will teach you. Father in heaven, we do thank you for this time that we can come before you this morning. And Father, I pray that this would be a time in which we would truly hear what you have to say to us. Lord, help us just to put aside all thoughts of the world and concentrate on you. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now, as we begin this series of messages, uh, I, I want to make something clear. I, I've said this before, but I want to say it again. One of the things that I so love about the Bible is that it pictures and presents people just as they were. And so when we study these giants of the faith, what we're going to discover is that they weren't perfect. Now, where they had great faith, but many times they also had great flaws. And let me just say, that encourages my heart. I just to think that God could take Abraham, who was a liar. He could take Joseph, who was a schemer. He could take Rahab, who was a prostitute. And in spite of their flaws and failings, in spite of their sins and shortcomings, he could use them to point us to what real faith is. And so that encourages me uh, to simply know that God can use even me if I have real faith. Look again at what he says, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Twenty-four different times in this chapter we find the word faith. And what is faith? It's simply taking God at his word regardless of of the situation or circumstances we find ourselves in. See, that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk, we live by faith, not by sight. God expects his people to live lives of faith. And so as we begin our journey with these giants of the faith, we're introduced, first of all, to a man by the name of Abel. A name that means breath or vanity, and, and perhaps through that name, God was letting Eve know that her second son wasn't going to live that long. Perhaps 
We don't know. But what we do know is that even though Abel didn't live a long life, he lived a strong life. And the reason he did was because of faith. The Bible tells us he had a worshiping faith. Look at verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Now, if you go back to the book of Genesis, chapter 4, you're going to find where the first couple, Adam and Eve, gave birth to the first brothers, Cain and Abel. And I know that everyone here, even our young children, probably know that story. One day, these brothers brought their offerings and laid them before the Lord. And Cain, we're told, brought an offering of the field. Abel, on the other hand, brought an offering of the flock. He took a little lamb, killed it, and offered it to the Lord. And the Bible says that God accepted Abel's offering, but rejected Cain's. And as a result, Cain became angry. The Bible says they were out in the field working together, and Cain rolled up against Abel, and he slew him. And so the first murder in history was committed by the first brother in history. The first murderer was Cain. The first martyr was Abel. The first to die for his faith. And, and what I want to do this morning is talk to you for a while about his faith. See, there, there's a reason why Abel's faith is mentioned first. I mean, through his worship, he displayed and demonstrated the kind of faith that it takes to have fellowship with God. Through his worship, we see he not only heard God's word, he heeded God's word. Because he followed God, he had fellowship with God. And so this is what I want us to look at in our time remaining as we think together about worshiping faith. There are four things this morning that I want to call your attention to. The first of which is God accepts our worship when our worship is accepted. God accepts our worship when our worship is acceptable. Again, verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent, a more acceptable sacrifice. Now, in the Bible, sacrifices and uh, offerings were, were pictures of worship. And so it's very evident that we're being taught something in this these verses about worship. And, you know, if you're going to understand what life is all about, then you're going to have to understand something about worship. Because worship is the basis for understanding the greatest question that man has ever asked, and that is, why am I here? And the answer is, man was created for worship. And if you don't understand that and the importance of having a right relationship with God, you're, you're never going to understand what life is all about. You know, Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 12 <laughs> that the first and greatest commandment is, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. In other words, we're to love and worship God with everything that we have. Well, thousands of years ago, two brothers came to worship God. And the Bible tells us that there was a specific place, there was a specific time, and there was a specific plan that was to be followed. And no doubt Adam and Eve had already, after the fall, explained to their sons exactly the kind of, of worship that God required. And, and so Cain brought his offering and Abel brought his and we, we know what happened. But the question that has to be asked is why did God accept Abel's sacrifice offering and reject Cain's? Well, here's, here, here's the thing. God didn't just reject Cain's offering. God rejected Cain. You see, it wasn't his offering that God rejected. His heart wasn't right before God. And, and so, uh, you know, here what we learn is we, we've got to come to God for a worship 
on his terms, not ours. And that's a mistake too. They, he thought that he could do something. He could work the ground and he could produce something by his hands that he could give to God and it would be acceptable. And yet he, what he learned was there's nothing we can ever do on our own. There's no sacrifice we can ever give to God that will be acceptable for our sins. And, and that's a mistake the majority of people today make. They think that if they can just do enough good works, good deeds, good things, that God will accept them. But what does the Bible say? Isaiah 64, 6 says, All of our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of God. Titus 3.15 tells us it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he said. So, you see, if you're going to come to God, you're going to have to come on his terms or you're not going to come at all. And his terms are real simple. You've got to come through the blood. You see, as one writer I read said, Cain learned real quick, you can't get blood out of the turn. We need to learn that. We need to learn that. Abel heard God's word, heeded God's word, and brought a blood sacrifice, and God accepted it. And that's a great lesson for us to learn today. In, in our worship, as well as our walk, we come to God on His terms, and that means we come only through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not any good work. It's only through the blood. That's the first thing that we, we see. God accepts our worship if our worship is acceptable. The second thing that I want you to take note of is that right worship becomes a witness of righteousness. Right worship becomes a witness of righteousness. Look again at what he says in verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. He wasn't righteous by the giving of his offering. The giving of his offering proved that he was righteous. Now, you know, we, I want us to understand this morning what real worship is because, quite frankly, there, there's a whole lot of misunderstanding about it today. <clears throat> Most people today think worship is simply coming to church on Sunday and clocking in with Jesus. It's more than that. So much more than that. Listen, why, why do you think God commands us to give the first day of the week to Him? Why do you think He commands us to give the first time of every dollar to Him? Because He needs our time? Because He needs our money? He doesn't need either of them. What He wants is us. He loves us and He wants to fellowship with us. You see, our, our time and money are simply ways we can show the Lord that everything we are and everything we have belongs to Him. You see, that's why the Bible says Abel brought a more excellent sacrifice. Genesis tells us he brought the firstborn of his flock. God deserves the first and God deserves our best. Most people today Expect the church to operate on spare time and pocket change. Hello. You know, those of you those of you who know me know that I don't I very seldom preach on giving. I think that's something personal between an individual and God. But let me just set the record straight. If you're not giving what God commands, if that is the time, your worship is worthless. Don't be mad at me. That's what God said. You give him what he deserves, or else your worship is in vain. You see, when you give God the first, and you give him the best out of a willing heart, that's a powerful witness of righteousness. That's why James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, You have faith, I have works. You show me your faith without your works, I'll show you my faith by my 
Worship. People say that's contradictory. No, it's complementary. Right worship becomes a witness of righteousness. That's the second thing I want you to see. Then the third thing that I want you to take note of is this. Just because the Lord has respect for your offering, uh, don't expect that the world will. Just because the Lord accepts your worship, that doesn't mean the world will. You know, Jesus, Jesus even gave us a warning in John chapter 15. He said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. The Bible is clear on it. Yes. If Jesus suffered, we're going to suffer. If they persecuted Jesus, they're going to persecute us. Second Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all who desire to live godly, that is, who, who live a life of worship and faith, will suffer persecution. Mark it down big and bold. That's what's going to happen. And you know, I, I, here's the thing. I think most people in most churches today accept the fact that Jesus Christ died for their sin and suffered for them. They just don't want to accept the fact that if they live the kind of life God wants them to, they'll suffer for him. Again, back in Genesis 4, we're told what happened as a result of the rejection of Cain's worship and the acceptance of Abel. Cain became angry while they were in the field. He rose up and he killed his brother. But let me ask you something. Who was Cain mad at? Was he mad at Abel? Probably. But even more than that, he was mad at God because God had rejected his sacrifice. Look at our nation today. It lashes out against everything those of us who are Christians stand for. But who does the nation hate? Does it hate those of us who are Christians? Well, probably. But more than that, it hates God because they don't want to hear the truth of what God's Word has to say. So, again, just because God accepts your worship, I don't think the world will. They're not going to. And then let me give you the fourth the last thing, and that is, even though you are mortal, your witness isn't. Even though you are mortal, your witness isn't. Hebrews 11, 4 ends with these powerful words. By it, by what? By his faith, he being dead yet speaking. Want to live beyond yourself? Live a life of worship. Because through your worship, there will be a witness that will live on beyond the years. You ever heard someone say about someone else? No, that was a man, that was a woman who loved God and walked with God. Could have been dead 30, 40, 50 years. And yet their witness lives on. No, Dietrich Bonhoeffer who was the great German uh, pastor and theologian, stood up for the Jews against the Nazis. And because he did, he was arrested and placed in prison. And in 1945, he was hung. But listen to his dying words. He said, you may think this is an end. But for me, it's the beginning. The beginning of the life that will last. How could he say that? By faith. He had the faith to believe that because he had placed his trust in Jesus Christ, he would live forever. And some 77 years later, he still speaks. Now, I, I don't know about you, but that, that's what I want. I, I want to be the kind of Christian that outlives myself. I thought about it. I, I hope that one day, years from now, my, my great great grandchildren will hear something said about me, or or will will wipe the dust off an old picture of me, and say, "I never knew him. I never had an opportunity to meet him." But they say he was a man that loved God and walked with God, lived a life pleasing. That's what I want. That's what God expects of each and every one of us. That we live in such a way that our witness goes on and on and on. 
through the years. How is that possible? Only by faith. By being perfect. Being pleasing. Living lives that are pleasing to God. You bow me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, for this example that you have given us. Of a worshiping faith. And Father, I pray that you would so speak to our hearts. That we want to live that kind of life. That Lord, we would take your word at face value. That we would obey it. That we would live by it. And know that only as we do is our worship accepted. Lord, we give this time to you. I have no idea what you spoke in your hearts today. But Lord, my prayer is whatever that is, whatever decision needs to be made, we be obedient. So Lord, this is your time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me. As we sing our hymn for invitation, come just as you are. If you know God's leading you to make a decision, you come as we sing. Mm -hmm.